identify and become elitist. As a woman who lived across the tracks and wanted to join a very fashionable church found out. And we're not a very fashionable church, so it's not like this is a perfect analogy for us, but bear with it. She talked to the pastor about it, and he suggested she go home and think about it carefully for a week. The next week she came back, she still wanted to join the church. He said, no, let's not be hasty. Go home, read your Bible an hour every day this week, and come back to me at the end of the week if you still feel like you should join. She wasn't very happy about this, but she agreed to it. The next week, she comes back. She assures the pastor she wanted to become a church member. In exasperation, he said, I have one more suggestion. You go home and you pray every day this week and ask the Lord if he wants to you to come into our fellowship. The pastor didn't see her again for about six months. One day, he sees her in a grocery store, and he says, Oh, what happened? What happened? Did you decide that you didn't want to come to the church? And she said, Oh, I did what you asked me to do, Pastor. I went home, and I prayed every day. And while I was praying, the Lord said to me, Don't worry about not getting into that church. I've been trying to get in there for years. <laughs> it's funny, but we probably know churches we would think that's true of, right? And that's why it's hard. One translation of the opening of our story today is, My brothers and sisters, do you, with your acts of favoritism, really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? The concept in James is that your belief leads to action, and when we look at your action, or when you look at your action, you learn about what you actually believe, right? If you show favoritism, you're not behaving as if you believe in the Christ that the early church believes in. And that makes sense, right? If the Bible teaches repeatedly to treat others as yourselves, to love sacrificially, and then we fail to do it, then we're just not doing what we said we would do. James is writing about a group of Jesus students who are prone to showing favoritism. This is showing more honor to one type of person than another. And this can be true of us. It's nothing new. It happened then and it happens now. It happens in really subtle ways. For instance, I, I have many colleagues that when they're on holidays, they check their phone regularly. And if one sort of person passes away, they happen to not see their phone that week. But if another certain sort of congregant passes away, all of a sudden the minister's available to do the funeral. It's a sort of favoritism baked right into what we do. And we don't even see it a lot of the time. This guy, Kent Hughes, he says, it may seem like James is making a big deal out of nothing or a really common sin, favoritism. Everyone does it. But he says, favoritism indicates the tilt of your entire soul. And so the end of the passage where J James says, you know, if you break a little bit of the rule, you're still fully a lawbreaker. Favoritism is tilting of the soul on display. Our actions, our way of being in the world are an outward sign, very concrete of our inner reality. If we treat somebody as below us, we telegraph to them that they are below us, right? no matter how much we would protest that in speech. Sometimes we look at people and we have fear and they immediately know that we feel insecure in their presence. We all know this, we all do this at times. And we experience it in situations. When's the last time you joined a new group or went to a new place? You are hypersensitive to absolutely everything. Do you belong here or not? And nothing written on the wall will convince you you belong there. So for instance, if you and I were to join a CrossFit box this week, and we got in our gym clothes, whatever they may be, right? We would be nervous from the first step until the guy in charge or the gal in charge asks us to do the first rep of whatever it is, at which point you and I would have no idea how to do the thing, and we would feel like we don't belong, right? And it wouldn't matter what it said on the wall. We do this. 
How we treat other people, how we get treated, is what would tell us whether we belong or not, right? Somebody in the locker room saying, well, man, those shoes aren't going to work. You're going to want to do this. Or like, don't wear that cotton shirt. It's going to go badly for you. But in a way that's helpful, right? Not, what are you doing here? That would go somewhere towards helping you know you belong. What their eyes say when they look at you tells you something. I see this regularly, and I see it because I do it, and I hate that I do it. But when you're in a group setting, and you're talking to someone, or shaking their hand, and you're looking over their shoulder because you know you got to talk to so-and-so at some point, it tells the person you're talking to they're not as important as that person. And I get caught doing this all the time because I have to have conversations. But it feels demeaning to all of us when we're on the receiving end of that handshake, right? This is the little bits of favoritism that tell us how our souls are doing. We know what happens and we all get comfortable with it. N.T. Wright, who's a great pastor, says, this is the paradox which James turns to in verse 13. God's mercy is sovereign, it will triumph, but the minute you say, oh well, it's all right then, God will forgive, it doesn't matter what I do, and in particular when what I do includes discriminating against the poor or other, then precisely because God is the God of mercy, he must act in judgment. He will not forever tolerate a world in which mercy is not the ultimate rule of life. Mercy isn't the same as shoulder shrugging tolerance and anything goes attitude. Anything doesn't go. Anything includes arrogance, corruption, blasphemy, favoritism, law breaking of any kind. If God was merciful to that lot, he would be deeply unmerciful to the poor, the helpless, the innocent, and the victim. So the whole gospel insists that in precisely those cases, his mercy shines out most particularly, so must ours. Now in the past, we've been really bad at this. Physically, we've been bad at this. Some of you know these stories. We sold pews for years, right? Do you know this? So you would purchase the pew for the year and your name would go on a little plaque and, and at the front was worth more money and at the back was less money. And so you could walk into a church and you knew exactly how everybody stood because they literally paid to be in the right spots. I find it funny, partly because we don't have to worry about the church being that full these days, and that would be a great problem to have. But they didn't have microphones, right? So quite literally, if you were near the front, you could hear what was happening better, right? Like it mattered to be near the front, like front row seats at the NAC cost more for a reason. So for years we did it that way, and we were very proud to do it that way, great way to raise money, but also a great way to blatantly show favoritism in a church. Sometimes we just remain very helpfully sensitive to this issue, and sometimes we don't. A few years ago, I was leading a different church, and we were building uh, an extension on the building. It was a weird plan, and uh, somebody who was fairly wealthy came up with the plan. And what we did was I, I met with 10 people. So the, the, the building was going to cost, I think it was like $75,000. And uh, I met with 10 couples. Uh, I called them, you know, can you guys come to my office? We've got to chat. And one of them could see blatantly the only reason I was calling him. And he's like, shall I bring my checkbook? I said, well, if you like. Uh, so we had 10 people come, or 10 couples come. And I sat them down. I said, listen, we're going to do this plan. If you could give us $5,000, that would be really great, because then when we launch it to the congregation, it'll you know, not be a very expensive proposition. So I met with them, I with 10 couples, and I think it was 75000 and when we launched it to the congregation, we said, the bad news is it cost $75,000 to do this thing. The good news is 63,000 of it's already raised, so we only need you to raise like 12 grand. And immediately, several of the wealthiest people in the church got up and they were livid because A, I hadn't identified them, I think, so I didn't ask them, but also, they were mad at the concept that rich people would be choosing what we did with our building. 
Like they thought this was clear favoritism, that we were allowing the wealthy couples of the church to literally change the face of the building and ignore what anybody else would want. And so we had to work through that as a group. It was this whole process because they were so attuned to not letting that be the case. And they cared about it because it's about the state of our souls. Psalm 146, you read, it denies hierarchies. It talks about how God is the God and the kings aren't and we aren't and the rest of us are all the same, equally not God. In the New Testament, we call Jesus his king. We say things like at the foot of the cross, the ground is level. It means we are all sinners. We all need grace. We all need forgiveness. And then we live it out by how we treat each other. James says, if you break part of the law, you've broken the whole law, and we've all broken the law. We admit that every week, right? We say a little prayer of confession. Whether what we confess is your specific thing that you did this week or not isn't really the point, right? The point is to remember that we break the law. And we all do this. In Ottawa, if you read the newspaper, you know that we have cameras at certain spots in the city to catch you while you drive. And everybody gets mad because it's a cash grab, right? All you got to do is not break the law. And you don't pay the ticket. Can we do that? I, I know little old ladies, 88 years old, four feet tall, they're getting speeding tickets. We are all... <laughs> guilty. Stand on Richmond Road and watch how fast the cars go by. At some point you get caught. The New Testament says, God who sees and loves all alike wants to have the church reflect that generous universal love in how it behaves not just what it puts on the wall, not just what it puts on the sign outside, not just what it writes in its bulletin, how we actually do it. Historians believe some of the earliest churches really made an effort to overcome this problem. We have records of ancient churches where when you walked into the church, you are greeted by other members. So if you're a known member, you would have Doug and Julie at the back and they would welcome you. But if you showed up and they didn't know who you were, the priest or the bishop, if you were in a cathedral, immediately was supposed to go to the back. And the poorer you looked, the more quickly the bishops would run to the back to make sure your presence was noticed and that you were welcome. It was a regular practice of the church to emphatically try to be welcoming to newer people, especially people who look different. Now in that story, it's interesting, right? Because you have bishops. So if you're paying attention, there is a hierarchy. There's a ranking there, right? There's the regular member, there's the vicar priest type, and then there's the big fancy bishop type in the purple. And the idea is that we have to avoid anarchy. You do have to have levels of stuff, right? Like you got committees, you got elders, you, you know, like you got people doing stuff. But if anybody asked who is in charge, the answer really shouldn't be Chris. The answer cannot possibly be their elders. And it's sure not the head office in Toronto, right? The answer has got to be Christ. It's always got to be Christ. So in contrast to Jesus, every status we hold in the church and out of the church is minor. Whether you're wealthy or poor, healthy or not, man or woman, single or married, deacon, elder, priest, bishop, whatever, we're all equal. Our personal status gets muted when you're face to face with the Lord of the whole world. And that's really hard. Because we live in a time where partiality is absolutely promoted and thought of as a good thing. Right? Even something small, super mundane. Pick a sports team. Do any of you have a favorite sports team? Some of you? Wow, we really don't watch a lot of sports, eh? All right. Uh, if you have a favorite sports team, does that mean you automatically also have a team you hate the most? Right? 
because it's partiality. We love it. If you, I read somewhere that the Ottawa Senators should be the most valuable franchise in all of pro sports because all the Ottawa Senators need to have a successful season is for the Maple Leafs to lose in the playoffs, and that's a lock. We love to show partiality. Pick a political party and you hate the other one. This is the world we're in. It even happens with companies. Do you remember the ads, the Mac and Apple ads? Like you pick one and then that's it forever and you make fun of each other. We love to show partiality. So then you get to church and we say stuff like, you know, in baptism, you die to all of that. Everything that came before this is gone and now you are a child of God. Your relationship to Jesus to surpass your relationship to all that can divide us. Even the Sens fan has to cheer for the Maple Leafs at some point. <sighs> yeah, there's some. Sometimes we live in fear and we do it poorly. Uh, one time I was at a church. Okay, so I was involved in this congregation in a way. I was the minister of another congregation. We were there, I was on holiday, and our kids were really little, and they were in the Sunday school, and it was a big building, and I had to go out this door uh, to go get the diaper bag, you know? And so I go out the door, get the diaper bag, and I come back to the door, and it's locked. And it's like a huge building. It's like, oh my goodness, how do I get back in this place, right? So I start walking around the outside of the building looking for a door. Three or four of them are locked. Finally, I get all the way to the front door. And it's one of these big cathedral things, you know, big fancy steps. And you get to the front door. It's Sunday morning. Church is happening. My kids are in the building and the door is locked. So I bang on the door. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, I got to get back in here. So finally, they open the door and the usher comes to me and says, you can't come in right now. We're having church. It's like, isn't that interesting? Like, do I look like a, like, what? I'm just like a dad with a diaper bag. Like, I, my kids are in your building right now. And that church is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And there's no surprise in that. We talk about taking all kinds to celebrate God's love, and that means actions, not just words. I emailed various people about stuff, asking for help. How can we do things? One of the uh, answers I got about how we could be more inclusive around here was to have more tables at, at coffee time because people are shaky sometimes and they need more of a table they can put their cup on. Like, that's really simple, right? Like, we can do that. And asking matters. I was also told by several people we need more chairs down there because people get tired and they don't want to have to stand for 20 minutes while they have coffee and chat with each other, so we need more chairs. These are subtle ways to be inclusive and welcoming to other people. Some of them you won't even notice. If you knew the font size we use on our PowerPoint, you would laugh. But it makes it that everybody can see it, I think, what we've got going on there, right? It means having more than one type of music on a Sunday morning. It means having staff that are committed to the elderly and that are committed to the young. I read this week of churches that don't do this that well. I spent a lot of time reading history this week because I thought this was a fascinating topic. Do you know there used to be literally comfortable pews and uncomfortable pews? So you could pay to be in the really nice ones with the cushions like all of you have, but you used to do it where the near the back, you would take the cushions off. So people sitting there, they didn't get a cushion. They just sat on the, on the, on the wood. And then at the very back, you took the back off the pew. So it was just a bench. And if you were really broke, all you were worthy of was a bench with no back and no cushion. Like physical obvious, blatant discrimination happening inside the church, right? Favoritism writ large. And we have come a long way from that. But if you go downstairs for coffee time, today's different because we're gonna have subs, so slightly different. But normally on a Sunday morning, I could make a map of where each person's gonna be and who they're gonna be talking to. There's a few of you that will move around, right? 
But mostly you got the holy huddle, which if you're not part of, tells you something important. And I've heard from several people in the last couple of years that have spent at least six months with us that they find us real welcoming, but not that friendly. Like after that first welcome, they're on the outside of the holy huddle. And there's a way in which I think that's putting people on that back pew without a cushion. It's subtle, but a newcomer would notice it. Like if we went to the gym together, we would notice it. James is trying to give us a vision of what the church is supposed to look like. Try to learn how to do this. And so I'm going to end with this story. I might have told you this before, but I was trying to learn more about how do we do this stuff. Like, how do we get better at this? Like, it clearly matters. And I was speaking with this woman who does accessibility surveys for congregations, like how to make your building space work better and stuff. And she has two kids that are severely developmentally challenged, and they've had to do a lot of work. Uh, but one of the stories she said is that she, she was at a church, and there's this woman, and her kid was severely autistic, barely spoke, uh, and was really just like a little kid. And they always stayed in the back corner of the church because, you know, she had to, like, get him in and out and all this kind of stuff as he made noise. But when they would have music, he would jump up and down and clap. And it was like the only thing he responded to in the world was like music. So he would jump up and down and clap. So the they congregation got used to this kid and he's doing his thing. Uh, but as time went on, the kid got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And as some people do, he got really big. And so he would be in the back corner, jumping up and down and everything shaking. Like it's not that big a building. You can imagine even here, like the glass kind of shaking at the back of the room. And so the woman's getting nervous that he's going to literally break through the floor or something. And so she's humming and hawing. Should I talk to the elders? What do I do? do I, like, can I keep coming to this church? So finally, she gets the courage to go to this head deacon guy who's in charge of the maintenance of the building. Just listen, like, I'm nervous. My son is so big. The whole thing is rocking back there. Like, I'm worried he's going to break the building. Do you think maybe I should stop bringing him? And the guy looks at her. He says, oh, no, we noticed that five years ago. We actually retrofitted that whole back half of the building. It shakes on purpose to have give because we knew he would shake it. Before she even asked, they spent thousands affirming her and his presence amongst them. That's doing what James is talking about. Trying to find ways to get out in front of it, get out ahead of it, so that we can be welcoming and inclusive to everybody. It's not a threat. It's about flourishing as a group of people together. And so we'll pray for that this morning and pray for that for our year. Let's pray. God, you place a call on us. You call us to be your church in Westboro. You call us to be your church at a time full of divisions, partialities, and differences. Lord, open our eyes that we would see the ways that we can be warm and welcoming, the ways that we can be friendly, and the ways that we can honor you by doing so. Guide us along the path, forgive us where we fail, and help us to do better in the future. We trust in you, in your holy name, in your grace, and in your invitation. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen.